This is my first Monkey Gras and my first time on stage at a Red Monk event, and so um, I'm actually really honored to be here. Um, and one of the things, this is a new addition to the slide deck. Um, in the last 130 years, we've seen a sea change in the world because of technology. And we've obliterated childhood diseases. My uncle, my father's brother, had polio. Uh, women can control reproduction which is a new thing which was made legal in the United States in my lifetime, in 1972. Um, my mother did not have hot water in her home growing up. Um, in the Great Depression, there was food scarcity. It wasn't a distribution problem, it was an availability problem. Uh, we've got chemistry, we've got atomic physics, we've got all of these things that have fundamentally changed the way that we interact with the world. And I think that, and th this is part of my lifeline to some of the stuff that's going on in the United States right now, I, I think that when people talk about hearkening back to the good old days, it's hearkening back to a time when things were not changing every 10 years. And if we take a look at what has changed over the last 20, we've gone from an information desert. We've gone from Claire having to walk to the library and lug books back to having any book that you want, any time that you want. The, the sum of human knowledge is available on everybody's phone. Um, and one of the problems that that's led to is a change in the way that brands work. So brands used to be there because we did not have the information available to make a good decision and there were a limited number of choices. Now there are nearly infinite choices and there is so much information that we can't make a decision, so we go with brand. We basically, the, we've gone from underload to overload and we do not yet know how to manage that overload. There's dozens of choices for every need and part of that goes into the earlier discussion about software availability. We've shifted from having two or three more or less crappy packages to having distributions. I mean, if you look at the Apache Software Foundation, every single piece of software in the Apache Foundation is better than every single piece of commercial software that I used in the 80s and 90s. And it's free, and I can download it, and I can use it off of Maven. It's just absolutely spectacular and frightening as hell. And I think one of the reasons for packaging is to help people deal with this glut of information, this glut of availability. So I'm recovering. I'm recovering from being a functionality over form person. I mean, James talked a little bit about my uh, dabbling in Scala. Uh, <laughs> I, in, the, in 1981, wrote the first computerized redistricting system. So some of that crap is my fault. Um, in 1992, I wrote the first real-time spreadsheet. Um, I, in about 10 years ago, I started a web framework project called Lyft, which turns out to still be one of the safest web frameworks around. I help popularize Scala. So these are all things, well, I'll talk about the spreadsheet, but you know, you look at Scala and there is a functionality over form. There is, once you're a priest, you can do magic with it, but until you reach that level of priesthood, you're screwed. <laughs> so I wrote this real-time spreadsheet. Um, traders loved it. I mean, they could take business logic and put it, they, they could basically do real-time trading and relative, relative in the 90s high frequency trading where they could change their algorithms in minutes. The code was fast and bug free. The UI was ugly as hell. It ran on next step. So Steve Jobs hated it. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not just talking about you know, offhand comments. For the first six months that we released the product, Steve went around to every one of our customers and said, it's got a crappy UI, don't buy it. He's gonna go out of business. We didn't. So lesson number one that I've learned, packaging awesome with a craptastic UI is stupid. By the way, I'm dense, so it takes me a while to learn these lessons. <laughs> so I wrote this really secure web framework. It was fast, it was way secure. I mean, um, Foursquare launched with it. Uh, Foursquare, um, 
if you guys don't know Rasmus, he was um, ran security at Yahoo when it actually counted. <laughs> he poked around at Foursquare, couldn't find a single problem with the site. That's because we built security in. This is when Foursquare had two engineers. Foursquare was able to scale with like no material outages, no Twitter style outages, um, for basically all of their hockey skip, skip hockey stick stick scaling phase. Thank you. But Lyft's documentation sucks. Even Google knows it. You know, I. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, sure, Lyft has reasonable adoption for a framework built on an 18th place uh, Red Monk language. Um, but you know, craptastic documentation hampered adoption, created a priesthood, and ultimately priesthoods hamper the ability for projects to grow, hamper the ability for communities to grow. And contrast this with what Jonas did with Akka. You know, Akka is a useful piece of software, but it is an easily used, easily adopted piece of software. It, is, it has great documentation. And sitting down with Jonas almost eight years ago here in London, talking, you know, he was talking about, well, should I do an actor package for Scala? I'm like, yeah, sure. And then he started talking about some of his philosophy around documentation, around making it easy. And I'm like, ah, you don't have to worry about that. This is a Scala community. You know what? I was fucking wrong. <laughs> so lesson number two, early excellent packaging leads to more excellent packaging. People do, in a, in a software world, what their predecessors have done. So if you do packaging and testing and documentation right early on, if you create good community early on, that feeds on itself. If you don't, it is a compound interest hole that you have to dig yourself out of. And you, know, you look at Docker. You've got a, one, a billion dollar plus valuation for an extraordinarily nice UI around LXC around union file systems. And you know, write once, run everywhere is a really, really good idea. Where have I heard that before? <laughs> so what have we learned so far? One, I suck at packaging. Two, packaging is good. So this Funkatron thing is my new thing. It's serverless on your cluster. So rather than having to be vendor locked into um, Amazon Lambda, Google Functions, whatever, you can run um, serverless style stuff on a Kubernetes or Mesos or Docker Swarm cluster. You can wrap Spring Boot, J2EE, and soon .NET apps the same way. So creating a really easy on-ramp to cloud native for folks who you know, have been doing the right thing for a decade. And there's also a bunch of stuff that I learned from the Scala world and the Clojure world and the Haskell world about creating compositional functions and a whole bunch of stuff around that that I'm baking in in a way that's like going to be hopefully non-threatening. But really, what have I learned? What is going to make this different than Lyft? What is going to make this different than Mesa? And the, I kind of have a driving philosophy. Uh, who here has seen the movie E.T.? Okay, you remember the scene where the kid wants E.T. to go someplace, so he puts out a trail of Reese's Pieces, and E.T. like picks up the Reese's piece, eats it, moves on, picks up the Reese's piece, eats it, and moves on. And as I think about packaging the project and the software and all of the pieces around Funkatron, I'm thinking about a small reward at every step for, for the adopters. And the adopters aren't just engineers. The adopters are engineering managers. The adopters are the people who are um, the CIOs who are saying, we're going cloud native, now go do it. So being able to give each of the participants in the ecosystem a Reese's piece at every step, whether it's documentation, samples, what have you, so that at each step, the participants in the community can be successful is the way that I'm thinking about packaging Funkatron. So kind of, James said, go meta. So thinking about how people learn, how people acquire knowledge, absorb knowledge, and what kind of people are out there, it's kind of three different dimensions. So you've got people who are visual learners. They see things. You've got people who are auditory learners. They hear things. You have people who are kinesthetic learners. 
for me when I was in law school, yeah, I'm a lawyer, um, I had to go to class, listen to the professor, and write notes. If I skipped the writing notes thing, I screwed up. If I skipped the, um, if I basically did an audio tape and then just transcribed notes, I screwed up. I had to actually go to class, participate and write in order to succeed. That's my learning style. But different people have different learning styles. And people have also different kinds of information absorption styles. So this is one of the things that I learned in the, the Lyft community, where some people would come in and say, I need to see all of the steps to how an HTTP request is being handled. I need to see every single piece. I'm like, no, you don't. You just put this thing in here, it'll be fine. Oh, you want to do this? You just do this thing over here, and it's fine. And for about 90% of the, the community participants, the exploration, the you make this small change and it'll all be fine, worked out extraordinarily well. But for the 10 to 15% of the people who needed to see the big picture before they could see how the little pictures fit in, it, it drove them out of the community. So having high level architectural documentation, having request flows, having things both written and visual and screencasts are all important. And finally, I'd like to talk about ducks. Now, one, one, of, one, of the greatest, one of the greatest sadnesses in my life, and the, this is, I'm not being trivial, trivial here. I've lived an extraordinarily charmed and wonderful life. There was an article about duck migration um, types that I found about three years ago that I didn't get a link to, and I've Googled it over and over and over again. But basically, about 40% of ducks will stay at their birth pond no matter what no matter the food supply, no matter the predator level. About 10% of the ducks will leave their birth pond no matter what. And about 50% of the ducks will go wherever there's good food, food and predator ratios. So you need the 10% of the ducks, you need the Scala and Haskell people, I'm sorry, <coughs> did I say that? <laughs> to go off and blaze new trails in order to give the other ducks the, that kind of that middle part of the duck population, the ability to have choices to make. So when you think about the different kinds of ducks, when you think about different kinds of um, learning styles and absorption styles, how do you kind of build packaging around a software, a, a piece of software and around a community to facilitate the needs of all of the various different participants? And so that, that's what I've been struggling with, and I've kind of come up with a bunch of different things. So first of all, having both big picture and cookbook style documentation is important. Having step-by-step -step, um, for developers, which is different than cookbook. Cookbook is, I need to do X. Great, here's the recipe for doing X. Step-by-step -step is, I need to be successful over the course of a couple of weeks. What are the steps that I have to take? The step-by-step -step has to be for developers, for operations, and for managers, because ultimately you need to package up software, you need to package up these complex things so that managers can be successful in the way that they manage their teams, and so that managers can be successful in terms of the way that they flow information up to the CIO, or you know, through end chains to the CIO, who's saying, cloud native now. We need words and diagrams for the, both the textual and visual learners. We need blog posts because sometimes an, experi an experience, which is typically what blog posts are, help kind of trigger the, hey, I'm like that and I want an experience like that. Screencasts, screencasts are also extraordinarily powerful for the visual learners and for the people who are more real time than, okay, I need a piece of paper or I need something on a Kindle or on a screen that I can pour over at my leisure. And ultimately, you need stable URLs for every single release so that it, you're not relying on Google, you're not relying on Stack Overflow to be your knowledge base. They should be augmentations rather than the core knowledge base for any system for packaging up any software. So I spent almost two weeks writing what I call the holistic doc generator. And the holistic doc generator goes through every tag in every single sub part of the Funkatron project. It pulls out every markdown, every ASCII doc document, and formats them properly. 
and creates auto links to the, uh, the formatted docs. It pulls out Java docs, Clojure's codocs, Scala's, whatever the hell their docs are called. Um, I should know this, uh, et cetera. So basically, for every single tag release, there are stable URLs to every possible piece of documentation that was authored with that release. By the way, all this stuff is open source, so, and it runs in Docker containers, so you know, it'll run fine on your Mac, it'll run fine on Windows, and actually, in terms of Windows, I actually have a Windows box that I test a lot of this stuff on to make sure that the Windows developers, because, you know, they're 25 or 30% of my target population, the Windows developers can be just as successful as the Mac developers and the Linux developers. So here are a couple of examples of the documentation. Text with visuals. Sequence diagrams. So the different, presenting the information in different ways so that different people can consume it and so that it will be absorbed by the different, uh, by the different personality types. Screencast and blog post with code, with copyable code. You copy and paste it, yay. And the example code packaging, there are a lot of examples. And part of, not only do I have holistic documentation, but I also have holistic testing. The holistic testing basically goes through and uh, for a given tag, will, in a um, fresh, clean Docker container, build and install all of the artifacts related to that tag for all the sub-projects. It will compile and run each of the document, uh, each of the example pieces of example code. Um, it will simulate somebody creating a new project and adding some code to that new project. It will do all of the things that ensure that the code as a whole works as expected. Um, support different types. So there's um, basically examples that you can, if you're kind of an explorer, you can like start with an example and start changing it and exploring to see how it works. Um, if you're the build it from the ground up kind of person, great, there's a Maven archetype. You start there. There are different languages. There's Java, three different examples, including um, a Spring Boot example. Scala, Kotlin, Clojure. There will be more. Many build tools. So looking at how to package for different constituents using different tools. So how do you deal with the home pond ducks? The people who have said, I've been doing Spring Boot for 10 years, it works just fine. And when their CIO says, fly to a new cloud, or fly to cloud native, um, the first thing is with Funkatron, starting looking at the developer experience, um, even though it's serverless, you can run it on the cloud, for the developer, there's a miniature uh, version in a Docker container that simulates all of the things that would happen up until your, um, your app gets a request. The request is sent over the wire or over TCP connection to your app. You can debug it, you can set breakpoints, you can use um, IntelliJ, Eclipse, whatever tools you're used to using, however you're used to using them. So we're not saying learn a new tool for this. We're packaging it up so that the, the developers have the same experience that they've had before. Um, and once again, works with Spring Boot. I, sorry, I, we dropped that on Monday, so I keep saying Spring Boot, Spring Boot, Spring Boot, and a lot of people are saying, yay, so it makes me happy. Um, but what about the flyaway ducks? How, how do we help the people who want the shiny new thing? Because ultimately, the cloud native, the stuff that appeals to the people in this room. I mean, look, we're all part of that 10% flying to a new pond duck. We're all trying new things. We're all exploring. We're all pushing the, the boundaries. Um, you know, there's functions as a service, as a service goodness. Um, there's functional composition. And, you know, I've tossed in some subtle lessons that I've learned kind of trolling through the functional languages that I've trolled through over time. Finally, um, I've looked at project guidelines and sitting down and looking at what Postgres does with documentation. Postgres has some of the finest documentation out there. Having the stable links for each version was something that I um, looked at and said, hey, Postgres does this well. And so I start, started talking to some of the people in the Postgres community. I'm like, how do you do this so well? And their answer was, we will not accept a pull request. We will not accept a commit unless there's documentation for that commit. So that's a rule, pretty easy. 
And once again, this is something that starting off as a greenfield project, I have the ability, I have the latitude of saying, these are the rules. The rules will become self-reinforcing pretty quickly. Um, the, re the release process includes a holistic test and the holistic documentation release. So, you know, you go to the Funkatron.org site today. That's actually auto-pushed, or well, manually pushed, but it will soon be auto, uh, based on each release. So you can actually scroll down and see each of the tagged releases. And some of the stuff that I did do right, I mean, I kind of, you know, talked about the stuff that I did wrong, but some of the stuff that I did do right um, in the Lyft community, we had one of the early codes of conduct, um, and we were pretty, uh, uh, pretty solid about enforcing it. Um, we had uh, a, um, a requirement that committers and people who were kind of in good standing in the community would be extra helpful to, to noobs. I mean, you know, let me Google that for you was verboten in our community, you know? And one of the things that I did in terms of creating a trusted committer community was saying, it's not about the code that you write. It's about how you've behaved in the community, especially how you've helped noobs. And it turns out that we have a community full of nice people who teach, which has, you know, for me, I stepped down as a benevolent dictator for life about five years ago. And we did a, a really graceful transition to two other people who were um, leading trusted committers who were able to carry on the project. And yes, I still contribute to it and I still vote, although I vote a plus point one or a minus point one because I still want my vote to carry roughly the same amount that any other trusted committers vote would carry. But we've been able to make that transition because we had a community that was rock solid. So those are things that I want to carry on into Funkatron. So at the end of the day, packaging is free. Developers have a lot more excellent stuff than time. There are a lot more awesome sneakers that James can buy than he has time to shop for. Um, adoption in open source is success. If you get reasonable adoption, uh, the, the projects ultimately become reinforcing because enough people have skin in the game and enough people are adding to the project that the project becomes successful and self-sustaining. And ultimately, with packaging of Funkatron, I'm trying to appeal to three different dimensions of learning, absorption, and kind of personality types in the overall uh, stuff that we're delivering. So that's it. Thank you for your time. <laughs>